Hey everybody, welcome to the channel, True Crime Stories. If you're new to the channel, please hit that like button and subscribe so you can hear more. Thanks for stopping by. There's only one family photo of Jackie English. The 15-year-old girl lived in a time before every moment was captured on camera. She didn't live long enough for high school, graduation photos, or wedding pictures. It's a photograph that's been used for more than five decades. Police used this photo when she first disappeared on October the 4th, 1969 in London, Ontario. More recently, it's been used in memorial walks that have been held over the years to, co to commemorate her death as well as others that went missing or died or were murdered during that time. We first began investigating the gruesome murder of Jackie English. We were intrigued by the fact that her sister was still holding vigils all these years later. Dozens of London residents gathered on a damp autumn night to retrace her final steps. When Jackie left her part-time job at a local diner and was last seen getting into a car halfway across a bridge overpass, Jackie's sister Anne remembers having a gut feeling that she would never see her sister again. I just knew that Jackie wasn't coming home, she said. Other children had gone missing in the area, and they all turned up dead, she recalled. Five days later, Jackie's nude body was found 70 kilometers away, floating in a creek. She would become the eighth child or young woman to have been abducted and killed in less than two years. By now, Jackie would be retired, collecting a pension, maybe with some grandchildren to spoil. Instead, her sister says, Jackie is forever 15, a memory of a long time ago and a reminder of crimes that have not been solved. Everybody's lives would have been different, her sister says. Jackie never ages. Every time I look at that photo, I just remember all the years that she missed. Jackie is very vivid, and she will, she will forever be 15 years old. It's hard to imagine how quiet and lonely Jackie's Eng Jackie English's last walk was across Wellington Road overpass before she was abducted and murdered. Half a century ago, Highway 401 was just four lanes. There was no whizzing of traffic. There was no Costco or McDonald's, and there was no bus stop. At the end of her shift at a restaurant in the former Metropolitan Department Store, that was called Tre Treasure Island Plaza, Jackie left to walk across the bridge to go return home from work that night, but she never made it. Five days later, her body was found by two duck hunters in Big Otter Creek. Now keep in mind, Big Otter Creek was the same area where Scott Lashman was found. Jackie English woke up on October the 4th, 1969. She woke up late that day in her apartment on Kent Street. After breakfast, she put on a pretty black and white dress. It was a checkered skirt. She arranged her hair in the updo that she wore and slipped on her brown penny loafers. She went around the block to her boyfriend's house. His name was David. Inside the apartment, they casually lounged and listened to records. Now, David would later say that they had sex that day because I guess that when her body was found, there was signs of a sexual assault, and he did let the police know that the two of them had had sex earlier that day. She asked him to go with her to visit her mom in the hospital. Doris, her mother, later remembered thinking that her daughter was out of sorts. Now, this will come in. Uh, several people said 
that she didn't seem herself. She seemed worried and bothered that she wasn't her regular upbeat self that day. But others say that wasn't the case. They saw no signs of anything different about her. Her boyfriend says he didn't, she didn't in, in, tell him of anything unusual or that she was worried about. She said that Jackie told her that she didn't really want to go to work that night, but she told Jackie to go anyway. She said, you have a responsibility to your job and you need to go. Otherwise, she said their event, their visit was uneventful. Jackie told her mother goodbye, and the David, her boyfriend, and they walked down the hall together and got on the elevator. Now, Linda Hurst was a co-worker of Jackie's, and she was working in the restaurant with Jackie that night. She told Dennis Alsop that Jackie wasn't herself that night, and she hardly spoke to any of the other waitresses. They were busy, but they were really busy that night, and everyone was running off their feet, she says. It was hustle and bustle. You see, there was no bus stop near this restaurant. The metropolitan area was about as far on the edge of town as you could get. Now, that was the name of this department store, the Metropolitan. It was about as far on the edge of town as you could get. It was abandoned, dark, and isolated at night. The lonely bus stop was on the other side of the highway across the overpass, across the overpass extension. Alsop recorded multiple eyewitness accounts of, of Jackie seen that night as she left work. Consistent information was that she was wearing her uniform, which was a white uniform with orange stripes down the front. Reports were that she was seen getting into a car that night on the bridge as she was walking out, I guess, she was walking toward the um, bus stop. Someone came along and offered to give her a ride. And people, eyewitnesses, said that they did see her getting into a car. Jackie never made it to the bus stop that night. Instead, she got into the back seat of a car that was described as a blue sedan with only one occupant. Others say that they believe it was a white sedan. Now, this was the description of the car that was involved in the uh, Jacqueline Dunleavy case. Scott Lashman, Frankie Jensen, all these people were seen getting into a white car or a white car was in the vicinity of where they were last seen. Now, under the lights of passing cars out on this dark road, it could have been that the car looked blue. It is unclear whether the driver was someone that she knew or just some random stranger who stopped and offered her a ride. It is certain the detectives do believe that whoever was driving that car was most likely her killer. Jackie had been living with friends because of financial hardships of her family. Her father was worried, and he did contact the police on the evening of October the 5th after hearing from one of her roommates that she hadn't come home. Now, four days would go by before she would really be looked for. On the evening of October the 9th, two duck hunters discovered Jackie's nude body floating face up in Big Otter Creek, the same body of water where Scott Leishman had been found in May of 1968. The dump site lay approximately 45 miles from where Jackie was last seen. None of Jackie's clothing or belongings were found at the scene though a ring remained on her finger and a pair of inexpensive earrings that she was wearing to work that night. They, these were discovered near the body, and they believe that the killer had removed these earrings from her ears and laid them there. Now, they say they believe Jackie's body was thrown from this bridge, but with these earrings laying there the way that they were, I believe this killer probably had to walk down to that area to lay these earrings down. He probably did throw her body off the bridge because it was probably easier than trying to carry this, this corpse down this embankment to the water. At 
As the remains appeared far too fresh to have been in the water for five days, it was a theory that her body had been kept at some other location and dumped probably the night before she was discovered. A post-mortem exam determined that Jackie had been killed by a single blow to the back of the head, probably from some type of crowbar or tire iron. There were no signs of... Se okay, let's get back into this. Just like with several of the others, they say there were no signs, obvious signs of sexual assault. And some of the earlier stories that I talked about... It's my belief that the sexual assault was oral. There were no obvious signs of sexual assault. She had had sexual intercourse prior to her death, but her boyfriend said that they had had sex. Now, the semen found inside of her body, at that time they did not have DNA, so they tested it as a blood type, and it didn't match his blood type. So they believe that Jackie had had consensual sex with her boyfriend that day, and that was where this body fluid came from. But she may also have been sexually assaulted orally, as I said. On October the 12th, several articles of Jackie English's torn clothing were discovered in Bayham Township along County Road 46. The location where the clothes was found was about 18 miles away from her body. Now, this takes us back to Linda White. Her body, her clothing was found. Some people said that her clothing was found wrapped around a pole. Others say that they had been put placed on this pole. And her body was found probably about 20 miles away from that area. Police recovered a semen sample from Jackie's torn underwear that was different from the semen that was found inside of her body. So see, she may have been sexually assaulted by someone else. On October the 19th, a woman named Betty Harrison reported to police that she and her family had been eating at the Metropolitan Store on the night that Jackie English was abducted. According to Betty, she saw two dark hair men who seemed to be very similar. She said they, they could almost be twins, these two men. They had a very similar appearance. They were speaking to Jackie that night on separate occasions and that Jackie did not seem to really want to talk to them. She tried to, she seemed to be trying to avoid them. Uh, police developed a sketch based on their testimony. And this, on October the 20th, more of Jackie English's possessions turned up in Ontario. This time it was a pair of brown penny loafers that she'd been wearing the night she disappeared. The killer had apparently attempted to throw the shoes into a pond on a remote um on a remote country road, but had missed the mark and the loafers ended up on the bank. Probably tried to throw them out the window of the car and instead of going into the water, they landed on the bank. The spot where the shoes were found corresponded very closely to the location of where the body of 20-year-old Georgia Jackson had been discovered in March of 1966 though it seems the two investigations did not explore a link between the two at that time. Later, the two murders would turn out to have very similarities, very eerie similarities. Both young women had dark hair and both worked as waitresses. Both had been abducted while walking home from work. Georgia was raped and smothered, and her body was not discovered for at least a month. And Jackie, um, as in the case of Jackie, some of Georgia's clothing was found discarded a distance away from her body. Jackie's death was at the height of horror in this area. It was one of the most prominent homicides that the city earned the unlikely reputation as one of the most dangerous places to be. 
Ann, her sister, said she's reached a point where knowing that her sister's death will never be solved. My primary concern is making sure Jackie is remembered and not forgotten. Second to that, I would like for her there to be more answers to her case, but I don't think that I'll ever get them. Now, she's 66 at the time that this article was written. Uh, she would be around 73 now. And she continued to have these uh, candle walks, these vigils, to mark the walk of her sister's last steps. There have been moments over the past five decades where there was some hope. In 1973, a high-profile trial of a man who was acquitted for an attack on a woman who was a witness in Jackie's disappearance. Now, you remember I talked about this woman came forward and said, that she saw this Jackie, there, there were two black haired men in the restaurant talking to her that night. Now, this woman was later attacked. Jackie's killer also left a small shrine consisting of a few of her possessions, such as a pencil case, a cosmetic bag, in front of her family's home two weeks after her murder. On November the 14th, now this is the story that takes us back to this, this witness being attacked. Now, Betty Harrison had talked to the police. She gave them a description of a man or two different men she thought that were in the restaurant that night talking to Jackie. This led to police putting out a composite sketch of this man, and later she was attacked. Phone calls started coming into Betty. These were obscene phone calls. Considering Betty's status as a possible witness, police took the calls seriously. They put her house phone on surveillance. Now it went from these phone calls to a to later to her being assaulted. Now Betty Harrison. On the morning of December the 7th at 4.30 a.m., Betty reported to police that they heard her family had heard a loud thud on their front door Police spot and that they spotted a vehicle speeding away. Four days later, on December 11th, Betty found a sympathy card in her mailbox that says, Watching You. Later that same day, Betty was out running errands, and at some point, she took her dog to the city park for a walk. When she got back to her Volkswagen with her dog, a man emerged out of the darkness, slipped into her passenger seat, and held her knife to her throat. He told her that he had been watching her, and he proceeded to slice open her cheek. She said that he licked the blood off of the knife. He began to fondle her over her clothes and told her that he liked having sex with dead women. She said that he then began to stab her and slashed her, cutting her face nearly 30 times, and then began to inflict wounds on her hands and legs. She fought him off, and the man jumped out of the car and fled into the night. She was able to then drive herself to the hospital where she was treated for her injuries. She told police that the man's voice sounded the same as the one that had been making the obscene phone calls. Now here we come back to Glenn Fryer, a man named Glenn Fryer. Now keep this in mind. Glenn Fryer was a principal at a children's psychiatric research institution. And yet in his home, when the police came to search his home, they found photographs of uh, pornographic photographs of children. These were probably the children in this hospital. He was eventually charged um, with the attack on Betty Harrison in 1969. And he was also thought to be responsible for the obscene phone calls. It was unclear whether he had anything to do with the murder of Jackie English. 
but as his trial took place in 1970, he was acquitted of all charges. No other suspects were ever arrested for the assault on Betty Harrison. And this is where the Glenn Fryer aspect in all this disappears. He, um, all the stuff in the, his file and in his trial could not be found. I hate to leave Jackie's story kind of right there like that, but um, there really was not much more about her case. Her body was found floating in the river. The police believe she'd only been there for one day. She'd been missing for five days when her body was found. She had been sexually assaulted in some way, and... Um, she died from one blow to the head. February the 18th, 1966, 21-year-old Georgia Jackson vanished while walking home from work. She worked at a job at a dairy in the hometown of Alamer, Ontario. She was only a half an hour away from London, Ontario. Her body was found that March, raped and smothered to death. Her mother says that the finding of her daughter's body vindicated the family that the girl had not just up and run off. This was probably something that the police had said. Um, a conservation officer for the Department of Lands and Forests saw an object on the roadway and stopped to investigate. On discovering it was a body, he immediately drove to the nearest town and contacted the police. The 20-year-old Georgia Jackson's body was discovered in a sheltered section of a woodlot owned by Robert Heffernan, about 150 feet from the county road. And he said that he passed through the area on Monday and he did not see anything like this. So they believe her body was brought out there and placed there. Another detail about Georgia Jackson is that when she was found, she was found entangled in brush, and they think that someone had tried to conceal her body underneath this brush. She had been sexually assaulted, and she did die from a blow to the back of the head, and um, one of her ears had been cut off. They said almost like a medical procedure. It had been cut off uh, very precise. And this takes us back to Linda White, whose arm had been removed, and Priscilla Merle, whose body parts were found floating in different creeks and streams and waterways. Now, in 1971, 21-year-old David Bodemer, who knew Georgia Jackson through membership in the Jehovah's Witnesses, came forward well, he, he didn't come forward. He confessed to um, his church that he raped and killed Georgia. They, they both belonged to this Jehovah Witness church together, and they knew each other. And then this happened. Georgia died in 1966. He confessed to killing her. David Bodemer, 27, of Kitchener, was sentenced Tuesday to life in prison for the non-capital murder of 20-year-old Georgia Jackson. David Bodemer was a father of five. He was charged six years after the death of Georgia Jackson. Now, his, his lawyer argued that the People in the, in the Jehovah Witness Church coerced him into confessing that they believed because the two of them knew each other that he must have killed her uh, for whatever reason. And his lawyer argued that he, he con confessed because they pounded it out of him. David Bodemer served 10 years of a life sentence and was released. We'll move on to the next story is the murder of Soraya O'Connell. 
Zaria O'Connell was one of eight people murdered in and around London, Ontario during the 1960s. At around 7 p.m. on the evening of August the 14th, 1970, 15 year old Saraya O'Connell decided she wanted to go to the youth center and play cards with her friends. The site of the youth center was located very near to the area where 11 year old Robert Stapleton had been discovered in September of 1969. Now, I spoke a little bit about Robert Stapleton. Robert Stapleton was found, he had disappeared from Piccadilly Street. He was found in the woods about a, four months later. His body was discovered. There was no signs of any type of sexual assault. His clothing were all on his body. And there was no real signs to determine his cause of death. I was really suspicious of whether or not Robert had maybe been killed by his family, his stepfather or someone and his body may be been placed in these woods. The only thing that gave me a red flag was that he went missing from Piccadilly Street, which was very close to Argyle Street, where Linda White went missing, and very close to State Street, where um, Patricia Bowen was murdered. So this is a very tight little area where all these people were either murdered or went missing. Other than that, Robert, who was 11 years old, his stepfather reported him missing, and he wasn't found for four months. And there was very, very little about him, but we'll get back to Soraya. Soraya's mother dropped her off at the youth center and told her she'd be back to pick her up at 10 p.m. But when she arrived back at the youth center at 10 p.m., she was told that Soraya had left the youth center at around 9.30. Another boy who was at the center told her mother that Soraya had left because she decided she wanted to leave earlier, and um, he told her he would give her a ride home, but she declined, and he ended up staying at the center as she walked away. She said she would just hit Chuck that it was only three miles. So her mother was not concerned, and she turned around and headed back home, thinking that once she arrived home, she would find Soraya. However, no one was home when she got there, and she called her husband, who was working in Toronto. He returned home that night, and they contacted the police about their daughter being missing. Police immediately treated the disappearance as an abduction, and they put a lot of effort into investigating her whereabouts. However, it would be four years before Saraya's body was found. It says her body was found four years later in 1974, south of Stratford. Now, when Soraya O'Connell's remains were found, she was also undressed, but none of her clothing was ever recovered. Very much like Linda White, she was found in a very dense area in the woods. She was covered over with scattered leaves and debris. It didn't look like a really, like a, like a grave. It was just more or less like they had attempted to cover her body up, but not completely. And just like Linda White, her body was also posed. Another thing that they discovered was that, very much like Jackie English, her earrings had been removed and were laying um, out on display next to her body. So the police were very much, you know, they very much believed that these cases were connected. And there's never been any um, resolution to any of these cases, like I've said before. All I can say is that these were some very scary times for the uh, London, Ontario area. If Dennis Alsop, the detective, had not kept all this information, and and at the time, remember, when he started keeping all these files and folders and pictures and things that he was keeping, um, there was no Internet or anything like that. He didn't have any idea that he was going to cause this um 
these stories to finally be connected in the way that they were. Priscilla Merle kind of brought these cases together for me. Um, this is from Facebook. Priscilla Merle was newly separated from her husband and living on Hill Street with her sister and brother-in-law. She was last seen getting into the white car of someone that she did know in front of her sister's house. She had two little boys, and when she went missing, the police didn't think anything of it. They assumed she was a newly single woman out having fun and left her boys in the care of family. Nothing was further from the truth. 21-year-old Priscilla Merle had gone out drinking with friends on the night of Saturday, March the 4th, 1972. Afterwards, she returned to her sister's apartment on Hill Street. Shortly after she returned, at around 2.15 in the morning of March the 5th, her boyfriend's brother, 39-year-old David Pullen, drove up in his car. They were going to go to another party nearby. It's 2 o'clock in the morning. She's already been out drinking. She comes home to her sister's. And then this 39-year-old man, who's a, supposed to be the brother of her boyfriend, comes to pick her up to take her to another party. Neither friends nor family ever heard from Priscilla again. She was never reported missing by her relatives simply because they believed she was just out partying and living her life somewhere. Less than a month later, gruesome hints of an appalling death would begin to appear around the city. Now, she had two little boys. She was separated from her husband or divorced from her husband. And they didn't think to call to report her missing. They just thought she just abandoned her sons because she went out at 2 o'clock in the morning to a party and nobody got suspicious or wondered, or did they ask this man that came and picked her up, hey, what would you do? Where, you know, when was the last time that you saw her and where did you leave her at and who was she with? On March 26th, a man was fishing in Kettle Creek when he noticed something unusual that had washed up with the tide. Upon closer inspection, the item proved to be a severed woman's arm. The limb remained unidentified for the time being, but on April the 13th, another grisly relic was discovered by another fisherman in the same body of water. This was the upper half of a woman's torso. On May 11, 1972, the lower portion of a woman's torso was discovered floating in Kettle Creek, about a half a mile for, from where the other body parts had been found. The head and legs of the victim were never recovered. Authorities were finally able to identify the remains of 21-year-old Priscilla Merle, who had gone missing from her sister's home in March. Because the body was woefully incomplete, police were unable to determine the exact cause of death. They also decided that whoever had murdered Priscilla was something of an amateur who nonetheless must have had access to a private dwelling long enough to carry out these mutations. The pieces of the body had likely been thrown off of the bridge now, this is what they believe happened to Jackie English. They believe that also happened to Scott Lashman and Frankie Jensen. And just like Linda White and Georgia Jackson, parts of the body had been removed, and Soraya O'Connell um, had been displayed in a similar manner to Linda White. So I don't know if all of these were killed by the same person, some people like to use the term copycat killer. I, I don't know about that. It's possible that whoever cut this girl's body up was trying to throw the police in, in the direction of the serial killer, but it's also possible that it could have been someone who just killed her in a fit of some, you know, moment. Uh, maybe they were raping her or something and they strangled her or choked her to death and had to get rid of the body in some manner.
Georgia Jackson's ear had been cut off. They said very skillfully as someone who knew what they were doing. And this body was cut up in a way that was really crude, like quickly. Chief Investigator Dennis Ossop was convinced that the last person who had seen Priscilla that night, David Pullen, the brother of her boyfriend, was the person who killed her. Ossop questioned the suspect on numerous occasions and even placed him under surveillance. The case against David Pullen was fairly compelling. Not only had he been seen picking up Priscilla Merle on the night that she disappeared, but his vehicle also contained small traces of blood, which had been di diluted with a cleaning solution. They also found a hacksaw in a toolbox. Despite the circumstantial evidence, Pullen never admitted to any wrongdoing, and authorities were unable to construct a case against him. The murder of Priscilla Merle, unfortunately, was soon overshadowed in the alarming whirl whirlwind of homicides taking place in the city during this period of time. But Priscilla's case was never solved just like all of the others. And I will talk some more later on about some of these other cases. But right now, I just want to wrap this series up. And like I said, I will come back and touch on some of these later on. And I appreciate everyone for watching. I know these videos ran a little bit long. I tried to include as much information on them as I could. And thanks for watching.